text for the scripture reading tonight comes from the book of Acts, chapter 17. We'll be reading verse 6. Acts 17, verse 6. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, Those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Good evening. Um, I guess first before I start, I just want to say how uh, as happy I am to be back in front of you all. Uh, you know, I greatly uh, miss you all, and I thought about you guys just about every week while I was in uh, school this year, how much you mean to me and how much uh, love you showed me. So I'm very thankful for that, and I'm glad I get to come up here and to present you a lesson from God's Word. So as you see, our title is People Will Be People. And so this is kind of a fact that is just life. When you choose uh, what you like to do, you know, you hang out with the people that you like to do those activities with. And, you know, if you're sad or if you're happy, you know, that can change who you hang around with depending on what you're doing. And a lot of times we hang out with people, you know, that we are religiously minded similarly with because that's who we like to spend time with. When you see the people in this picture, you know, they're having a good time. And a lot of us, if we're not too young, we can remember times where we were having an enjoyable time and we wanted to take a picture like these people did because we wanted to remember the, the time of which we were having so much joy, a, a fond memory that we can share with each other. And you know, throughout our life, we, we want to make sure that, or we try to ensure that we capitalize on the moments that we have been given in this life, time that, so we can hopefully, you know, have good memories, many more, with the people that we love. And yet, sometimes, you know, we have bad memory, we have you know, bad mistakes, or people have wronged us, and we know that we're supposed to treat others as how we want to be treated, according to Matthew 7, 12. But in our lives, there are about three types of people that we'll see. Those who choose to deny us, which is, you know, they don't like us, but, uh, and they don't, they deny company with us, they don't want to spend time with us. And then there's people that are devoted to us, or devout. And you know, those are our loved ones, our friends, people that stand by us. And then there's also the people that are deaf to you, which really means uh, that they just don't know your existence. And they don't really know you're there. But in Acts 17, when we study through this, we're gonna see that there's those same three people. There are people that are denying the gospel. There are people that are becoming devout to it. And then there are people who are deaf to it at that time. So as we'll start in verse 1, verse 1 and 2 of Acts 17 reads, Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the scriptures. As the text says, so Paul had an evangelism strategy that we see. His, his goal was that when he went to a city, if there was a synagogue, he would go there first. And this makes a lot of sense, right? He is traveling around the foreign world, and he is going somewhere where maybe not a lot of people know about God. So he, you know, he's going to reason somewhere where people would know about the Messiah. The Jews. Would, should know the prophecies of the Messiah, and they should be anticipating his coming. That's what they had been doing for so long. So it makes sense that Paul would go there to reason with them. But the second thing is how Paul reasoned with the Jews, and it's specifically that he did it from the scriptures. Paul didn't use his own, his own ideas or his own thoughts or someone else's. Paul talked to them just from the scriptures. And when thinking of that, I think we need to make sure we as Christians, when we're asked questions, 
about the Bible that we don't just spit out an answer or we say what somebody else told us, you know, like, oh, so-and-so, you know, said this about that, but that we say, hey, you know, this is what the Bible says, because when people question the doctrine of the Lord's church, well, the doctrine of the Lord's church is based solely off the Bible, because the Bible states how it should be and how it functions. So we should go to that. We should make sure that we know the importance of putting Scripture first when we're reasoning with people about the gospel. But the next section, verses 3 through 4, reads, Explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. As we just showed, you know, so Paul is reasoning with them, but this is more so demonstrating the manner of which he is doing so. He is um, well, literally, he's opening the scriptures and he's setting it before them there. And he's not, the important thing is that he's not doing this in a rude manner or anything like that. There's two ways you can present material to someone, either secular or religious. And it's you bring an idea to them and you can either be downgr downgrading to the person and shove it in their face, or you can be polite and you can set it before them. You can open it up and have them choose how they decide they react to it, whether they like the idea, whether they don't like the idea. And here we see that you know, the text says some, so obviously not all the, the Jews here, and if we know the story of uh, in Thessalonica, we will know it's going to happen to the Jews that did not believe. But regardless of you know, how many in total were there, it's amazing that because somebody properly reasoned from the scriptures, people were able to believe. And from 1 Corinthians 3.16, we know that that increase is because of God. And we need to remember that whenever we are out in the world speaking. But the next section of verses 5 through 8 reads, But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. And when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also, and Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king. While proclaiming people coming to Christ is definitely an awesome thing, sadly, a majority of this world, they don't really want to hear about Christ, and, and most oppose the recognition and distribution of God's word. Yet, Paul showed these Jews, he showed the Jews that, you know, they were looking for the Messiah and that Jesus was that Messiah, but they were too hard-hearted. They did not want to do what Paul uh, was showing to them. They wanted to live a life the way they are, and thus their reaction was very much of a violent, mean one. You know, they were attacking the house of Jason, and they were dragging people across the streets. Now, in America, we really don't see that kind of persecution for us. We, we need to take this as a lesson of what we A, need to be prepared for, but understand how a lot of people might react. You know, when we see the world, we see a world that thinks of us as people who are hateful and hypocritical because certain people that have very loud voices have said mean things and degrading people. And while it is true that they probably know our answer to questions on, on homosexuality and other things like that, but it's not that we hate the people, right? It's that we, we love them, but we want to make sure that they come to full understanding that they can't live their life that way. And we can't succumb to, their, to the level of the world of, like the Jews, of being hateful. You know, the people there, the brethren there, they could have just acted back at, at them, but they chose not to. But the second thing, and in verse 6, is that they knew. They knew of these people. It says that they knew of the people who had upset, or some translations will say, even turn the world upside down. Well, why? Because they were bringing something so awesome and so stigmatized, so dividing of the people. It's, it's, they were showing them that, you know, there was a man who chose, who was also a deity, who chose to die for you, and you're involved in this. You're involved in this amazing thing that happened, and yet they don't know how to react, really, right? They, a lot of people, they... They don't want to listen, right? They want to live the lives, their lives how they want. 
They don't want to follow what they would sometimes think is an unfun lifestyle, but a lifestyle that is very rewarding, that gives you joy, and that gives you a home in heaven. You know, some of those people, they might, they might doubt God. They might be mad at God because they may be thinking he's abandoned him, but we must remember that we should show them that God doesn't do those things. But then in verse 7 is that they denied Jesus as king. Now, if, if you recall some other times, the, the last time prior to this was in John 19:15, when Pilate says, Shall I crucify your king? And then the high priest responds, We have no king except Caesar. Where was God in the priest's mind at this point, right? God is their ruler, and they choose, you know, like, they're just wanting Christ crucified, that's it. And the first thing I want to see, want to show is that, you know, these people, like, you can claim to serve God, but your intentions will show how you truly feel. You know, people who serve God shouldn't act in that, in a a violent manner and be mean like that, but that, furthermore, if we also remember in 1 Samuel 8, 7, this is the, one of the first times it happens when Israel's wanting a king, it says, when God says, it is not you they have rejected, Samuel, but it is me they have rejected as their king. I don't know about you, but I definitely do not want to be one to be counted as one who rejected Jesus as king. I've had something in my life to, to do. I, I don't want to be known for that. And yet, you know, these people like Jason and Silas and Paul, they were proclaiming Christ. They did not care what situation they were in. They did not care what would befall them. They proclaimed Christ. And the question that I have is, if you can't admit to someone that Christ is your king, how will he ever admit to you that you are his on judgment day? Next, we go to those that are devout, and this starts in Acts 17.10, which reads, The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. So Paul was moved out of Thessalonica because everyone was, you know, all the Jews were very upset with him, and there was a lot of problems, so they, they moved to Berea. And you're like, okay, yeah, so Paul just picks up, and he just starts his own thing, right? There's no big deal about that, but you know, if, if your friends are attacked and so much resentment is given to you, there could have definitely been you know, discouragement in the situation, right? All the bad things happening, you could have t- he could have taken some time off, relaxed. He didn't have to start with the Jews, but he chose to, and it's, it's a good thing he did, right? He cared about people's souls. If one person's soul is saved because you had to endure harsh treatment and hardships or discouragement, that's worth it. That is definitely worth it. But then um, when we see in the next section is eleven twelve. Now these were no more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, speaking of the Jews. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. I think it's important to point out their eagerness. See, they were so excited to get into the word to make sure that Paul was saying what was true. And yet, we should have that same eagerness, whether it's Sunday, Monday, or any day of the week in our personal study or in study with the assembly. We need to make sure we're going to God's word because God's word has what we need in it. In the words of Paul in 1 Timothy 6.11, we're to pursue traits like righteousness, godliness, faithfulness, love, endurance, and gentleness. And the Bible has that for us. The Bible has everything we need and to, to live a faithful life to God so that we need to make sure we are eagerly opening it up so that we can see what it says. And unlike the Jews in Thessalonica, the gospel, and who chose not to accept the gospel, these Jews chose to, to listen and believe in Christ. The next, in verse 13, reads, But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also. They came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Two things about this verse. The first is that those who denied, they became upset again. Why? Because they found out. You know, the Jews in Berea, they could have been, you know, secretive about it. They didn't have to, you know, not say anything, 
do anything about it, but obviously they were talking about what they would believe because the, the Jews were finding out, and they were finding out that they were believing, and they became so upset. And they came down, and you know, they agitated and stirred the crowds more because they're so hateful. The second thing is that there are going to be people in our lives that will, will hate and despise the continual preaching of the gospel. They will want to stop you. They don't, there are people that don't want that to happen, and yet we have to understand that we need to work through that and that we can overcome that and show them the love and confidence that we have because of our Savior, and hopefully one day they can see that too. The next part is those that are deaf. And here when I'm talking about those that are deaf, it's the fact that, you know, you said earlier, they hadn't heard who Christ was. And they hadn't, it hadn't had any understanding of it, excuse me. And at, at this point, um, because of what had happened in Berea as well, Paul left Silas and Timothy, and he went down to Athens. And we pick up in verse 16 and verse 17 and when Paul is there. And verses 17, 16 and 17 read, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles in a marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. Verse 16 is, in, is incredible on its own because when you think of the world today, there are still idols today now unlike the idols that they worshiped then. We have idols like money, uh, celebrities, sports, ourselves, that you know, we can fall and follow, but one thing that's not as similar then as now is the fact, you know, how Paul, Paul felt. His spirit was provoked and he was upset, it says, because he was observing all the idols. You know, many Christians today, we, we see the world and then we just, you know, don't do anything about it. We don't feel anything towards the people that are in those conditions. You know, Paul was so upset about this, and yet we need to make sure that we have those same feelings of remorse. I know that the people in the world aren't our brothers or sisters or family members or anything like that, but they are still of equal creation in God. And we're all equal to God, and so when we want to go out into the world, we have to make sure that we you know, treat them as someone who we care about, as a soul that needs to be reached. And we know that God does not, like, does not want anyone to perish. And so, yes, people will deny us, like those in Thessalonica, and you know, some will graciously accept us, but we need to preach the word for those who need to hear it. We do not decide what path they will take. We only decide the path that we take. And if the path that we take is showing them the gospel, and that's the important part. The fact that we can bring the gospel to people who have not heard it before. Um, I was looking at one of the, um, a mission website and it said approximately 29% of the world had still not, had little or no contact to the gospel yet. There's still work to be done, but you know, majority of us in our daily lives, we're not gonna really meet people that haven't, uh, that haven't been exposed to something. They know something about God, whatever it may be. And, you know, Paul, after this whole incident, he goes to the marketplace. The marketplace was, you know, the most common place for people to be. And so he chose to go there to talk to people about it, to talk to people about the gospel. And for us, we need to think about where are we going to talk to people about the gospel? How are we going to be able to fit this in to connect with them? You know, Paul mentions in the chapter the unknown God. It's actually the unknown God in his sermon on Mars Hill. And he's connecting to what they know. And prior, Paul has done this too, right? With the Jews, he is stating the scriptures to connect what they know to Christ. We need to make sure that when we go out into this world, because we, we want to help people come to Christ, that we understand how we can connect to them. We have to understand where they're coming from so that then they can understand what 
Christ did for them. You know, sometimes people won't get it, and we have to make it clear to them. But the next section is um, verses 18 through 20, and it reads, And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, What would this idle battler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is in which you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. So obviously some were not a, some were not a fan. They were critiquing him. And others, their interests were piqued. And thankfully, I guess a lot more were. So, that, so much so that they asked Paul to go to the Areopagus or Mars Hill, depending on the translation, that they wanted to hear what he said. And you know, the interesting thing is that in verse 19, they ask for an invitation, right? These, these people, while some were critical, some of them, they ask Paul, they're like, can we, uh, may we know more about this, may we know what this teaching is, which you have been proclaiming. They're, they're trying to want to know more about that. And then, you know, we see in verse 20 that they say, for you're bringing some strange things to our ears, and they want to know what they means. They had a desire. They had a desire to figure out what all Paul was talking about. You know, obviously not everyone will react the same, and later we read that, you know, some of them scoffed at, at Paul. But throughout, you know, the different accounts of Paul preaching, it's shown that we need to be prepared uh, for people that you know, might, might deny the gospel, but we also need to be, you know, hopefully having people that are going, wanting to be devout to, the, to Christ in life, and then also people that are deaf. I'm not going to go into the rest of the sermon on the sermon on Mars Hill, the, the Areopagus, when I think it can be you know, not only the whole sermon on its own, but Furthermore, you know, the Areopagus was the place where Paul stood and he proclaimed the gospel further to all the people there. This week, I challenge you guys to be the place or the vessel which people hear the gospel from. You be the sermon. You finish the sermon for other people. You preach to them what, what Christ did for them and why they, should, why they should come to a better understanding of the truth so that they can become saved. We have to do that when we think of Acts as a whole, we think of, you know, all of this history that happened of the early church. And each one of us is the next chapter in Acts. The next chapter is, you know, we learn from the early church. We must take the gospel to the people. We must make sure we do it in an appropriate manner. And so there are going to be people, we, you know, people that it shows are upset, that are mad or, or hurt because of what we say. But there's other people, like Matt and Roger mentioned today, that are thankful for what God has done in their lives that they, they say that it all goes back to him. All of their friendships, all of everything they have, it's, what, it's all because of him. And when you have somebody who you think is gracious towards, towards you because you brought them to church and then now they have become baptized and they are a believer in Christ and their, their soul is in a right condition, you know, that's something that someone can never be thankful enough for because they did that. And, but then other people, you know, the people that are mad and upset, you know, maybe one day, just maybe one day, when they're thinking back on things, that doesn't mean they're old, or just sometime when they're recollecting, they think, they think of that way that they acted. You know, possibly the Jews thinking of how violent they were in Thessalonica. And like, why did I do that? And maybe what they were saying had some credence, and maybe they looked into it. You, you planted a seed for that person, and hopefully, as we said, you know, God will give the increase, and hopefully they will, they will become a Christian, but the point is, you, you did your part, right? You did their part in that. You know, Maya Angelou said, I have learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Regardless of whether they're on one side or the other, we must make sure that we, that we preach the gospel in truth, because the gospel is what is going to do the, work, do the work for us. It's going to hopefully pierce their hearts and make them come repentant. 
in the end, you know, we all, we all choose to deny at times, deny Christ. We choose to live, you know, a fleshly life or a life according to our own desires. And that can be you know, problematic at times. Or there are others of us, you know, that have not got a chance to do that. We want to make sure that we bring that chance to everyone that is able. So tonight when you leave, remember to be kind to others and bring the gospel with love to them because they need to know. And regardless of how you make them feel, by pro- preaching the gospel properly, at one point, hopefully, God will give the increase. If there is any need, whether public or private, please come now as we stand and sing. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How open thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would it hear again? He also be his disciples? Then they reviled him again and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spake unto Moses, as far as this fellow, we know not hence he is. The man answered him and said to them, Why therein is a marvelous thing that ye know not whence he is, and yet he opened thine eyes? Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, he, he, him he heareth. Since the, wor- since the world began, has not heard that any man opened the eyes of that of a born, was born blind. If the man were not God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sin, and thou dost teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found them, he said to them, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast been seen him, and he that taketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Keep your Bibles open to John chapter 9 for the majority of the lesson will be in that particular chapter, but we'll also be uh, exploring other passages as we go along. In the first verse of that chapter, the Bible says, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me, as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He answered. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. This morning we want to explore this particular miracle, the healing of the blind man. What did the man do? What did the blind man do? What did the Pharisees do? And by answering these questions and looking at these answers, we can also know what must we do? What can we learn from the healing of the blind man? I've entitled the lesson Do's and Don'ts, as you see there. Whenever we're following God or Christ, it is either we do or we do not. There is no just trying to follow God. We are either doing it or we are not. And as we look at this particular miracle and the healing and the things that surrounded all of the things that happened in John chapter 9, we can know fully what we then must do. So let's begin. What did the blind man do? First, we need to perceive the authority of Christ. In John chapter 9, and beginning at verse 15, the Bible says this, Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, He applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees were saying, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. And so they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, 
he is a prophet. The blind man had something happen to him that was, in, of course, miraculous in nature. And something that I'm sure that he had thought about many times, how great it would be if he had not been born blind. Jesus healed him completely. And now he could see. You may recall the woman at the well in John 4, 19, after Jesus had said some things to her about her lifestyle. And she said to him, the woman said to him in verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. This is something that she came to know and came to understand, just as the disciples did in John 6, beginning in verse 69. Previously to this particular verse, Jesus had been having some teaching that was hard for the disciples to to understand and come to a realization of. And so many of them left Jesus. Beginning in verse 66, the Bible tells us as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. And so Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away also? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Like the blind man, perceived that Jesus was indeed from God and was a prophet. He knew that Jesus had the authority to do what he did because of the very thing that Jesus did for him. He perceived who Jesus was, even though he was born blind. He could not see Jesus when Jesus first approached him. He perceived that Jesus had the authority to do what he did. And so therefore, because the blind man did, and we can look at this example, we also must perceive that Jesus has the authority that God has given him. In Isaiah 26 and verse 10, the Bible says, Though the wicked is shown favor, he does not learn righteousness. He deals unjustly in the land of uprightness and does not perceive the majesty of the Lord. Unlike those who reject God, we must perceive that God is who he says he is. Jesus is who he says he is and has the authority then to command us and instruct us in our lives on this earth. In John 10, beginning in verse 24, listen to what John shares with us here. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Again, in Matthew 13, beginning in verse 11, we find recorded, Jesus answered them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has to him, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. This was an answer to Jesus, the disciples asking Jesus, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he gives them this full and clear answer of why he was doing that. Jesus does not speak to us in parables either. We have the entire revealed word of God. We have all of the instructions that he gave to the apostles in the letters written to us, to the the various churches. And now that we have, that we can look at and read and learn from, From Romans through Jude, we can get instructions of how to live a Christian life, of how to worship God properly, of how to share the gospel with others, of how to be assured of the the salvation that we can have when we are a child of God. All of these things are clear and plain to us in the scriptures. But there are those who will still not perceive the authority of Christ the way that they should. And Jesus says, these people... 
these people that he was speaking to in parables were what Isaiah prophesied about. There are those today who have dull hearing, who will not see the scriptures in the proper light and therefore come to God as they should. But we can and should and must perceive the authority of Christ that God has given him. Next, we need to believe as the blind man did. Believe as he did that he is indeed the son of God. The blind man said that he believed that him, for him to be from God. In John 9, 30 to 33, the man answered and said to them, Well, here is an amazing thing, that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person been, been born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And then dropping down to verse uh, 35. Jesus heard that they had put him out and finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. We must believe, as the blind man did, that Jesus is who he says he is, that God sent him to this earth, that he is indeed the living Son of God. We must believe this about Christ. John the Immerser in John 3 and verse 36 said, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. In John 8, 23 to 24, he was saying to them, this is Jesus speaking to a group of Jews, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. This passage, John 8, 24, is used very often to teach people they must believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Without that belief, you have no hope of having your sins forgiven. And that is certainly true. The blind man believed in Jesus. He believed first that he was from God because of the very thing that Jesus did. But then when he was, Jesus told him plainly who he was, he said, Lord, I believe. When we have the ability to believe, perceive who Jesus is, and then develop a faith in him, the two are not, they, they are not mutually inclusive. One may perceive that Jesus is who he says he is, but develop no faith in the fact that he is the Son of God. The, the blind man believed, perceived who Jesus was, and he came to believe who Jesus was. We must do the same. We must perceive who Jesus is first, come to an understanding of that and all, of, all that that entails, and then develop a faith in that, a trust that leads to the next step of obedience. But before we get to another do, let's look at a don't. One of the things that will confuse people and Satan has used since the beginning of time is to put the teaching of man into the mix. We do not need to conceive any new type of teaching from God. Whenever we start thinking that we know what God wants and the way that God wants it to, to be as mankind, then we are deceiving ourselves. We should never conceive a new thing or new teaching that is not from God, that does not show the authority of God in Christ, that does not show that we should have the proper faith in him. When we embrace the teaching of man, it is something we should stay away from. It is definitely a don't when it comes to pleasing God. The Pharisees relied upon their own teaching. This is something they did. Look again at John 9, beginning in verse 18. The Jews then did not believe it of him that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight and questioned them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? And his parents answered them and said, We know, we know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But now how he sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. 
his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Look at the teaching that the Pharisees had here. They did not like the teaching that Jesus had been giving, the authority with which Jesus was speaking. And so they had told the Jewish people, if you believe this man to be somebody that we don't believe him to be, then we're going to put you out of the synagogue. Was this a teaching that would have come from God? Well, certainly not. It is something the Pharisees came up with on their own in order to maintain the power structure that they had in place. So instead of embracing Christ as the Messiah and seeing that he was fulfilling the very things that had been prophesied about the Messiah, they wanted to cast out anyone who disagreed with them, with their teaching. In verse 26, so they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? And they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. Isn't that a most interesting answer that the Pharisees give here? None of them would have been alive during the time of Moses, but yet they believed the scriptures about Moses. In John 5, Earlier, Jesus told a group of Jews in John 5, beginning in verse 41, I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? In Mark 7, beginning in verse 5, the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat, with bread, eat their bread with impure hands? And he said to them rightly, Did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God. You hold to the tradition of men. And these two verses, Jesus quelches this idea that the Pharisees knew what they were doing, that they were leading the Jewish people in the correct manner. He says, you put your hope and faith in Moses, and you don't even understand that Moses talked about me. If you believe Moses, you should believe who I am and what I am. But they did not. The Pharisees did not. In fact, they told the man being born blind, someone who, standing there, evidence of the power and might and glory of God. And they said to him, we're not a disciple of this man. We're a disciple of Moses. Forgetting, not even thinking about the words that Jesus had given to them earlier about how Moses had written about Christ. They were so involved in their own teaching and in, in their own traditions and the things of that, that they neglected the very teaching that God had given them. And they were changing it, construing it in a different way. This is something we must not do, something that has been going on since the beginning of the church. In Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9, the church in Galatia had gone away from the gospel that had been preached to them. And the Apostle Paul says to them, in the beginning in verse 6 of Galatians 1, I'm amazed. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if 
any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. And how can we forget the words from 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, where he told that young preacher, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. And then he gives the why in verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. There are those in the first century that were teaching things that were contrary to what the Apostle Paul and the other apostles had brought to them and what they had heard, what the, the new disciples, the Christians, people like Apollos, people like Timothy were bringing to them. And they were listening to something that was wrong. Paul says, it doesn't matter who brings you something different. It doesn't matter if someone says an angel from heaven gave them a vision or, or someone comes to them and, and some other man says, no, that's not really what the gospel means. This is the gospel you can follow. Paul says, that person, that person is to be accursed. Even if we, who's the we? The apostles? Paul himself, if he had come and given something contrary to what God had given in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation, according to Romans 1.16, then they were to be accursed. Today there is myriad organizations that will lead you astray if you'll listen to them from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And just like the Pharisees were trying to do to the Jews of that time, and even to the man who had received his sight, knew that they were teaching something that was wrong. It's like, why won't you believe what I've said to you? They were so entrenched in their own minds, the teaching that they were giving. This couldn't possibly be the Messiah. He didn't come from one of us. We don't know this man. We don't know where he came from. The blind man taught them, didn't he? It's an amazing thing. You can't believe you don't know where he comes from. He, if he wasn't from God, he couldn't do this. This isn't something that anyone could do. Let's not, let's not ever give in to the teaching of man, but look to God and what he teaches us. We, like the blind men, we need to receive the message of Christ and obey it. In John 9, 7, Jesus had given the command and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed, came back seeing. In verse 9, and, or 15 of chapter 9, then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, He applied clay to my eyes, I washed, and I see. He had perceived who Jesus was. He believed in Christ and the message that he had given. He received that message. He accepted it as truth. And then he obeyed it. This is what we must do. As followers of God, if I want to be a follower of God, a follower of Christ, I've got to know what the message is. I've got to receive it and then accept the gift of salvation that God is so willing to give us through his son, Jesus. In John 12, verses 48 to 50, Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day, for I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life, Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. 
Remember Romans 6, 22 to 23 tells us, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Apostle Peter preached the first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2. It's recorded for us. The day that the church was established and began, he gave a concluding, a concluding statement in answer to a question. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized for the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. This is the, the, the thing that we have to understand is that Peter was given the keys of the kingdom. What were those keys? To know who Jesus was, that he was indeed the Son of God, that he died and was buried and rose again on the third day. And because of that, we have the gift of salvation that God is giving to us, the free gift of salvation. And those that heard the message, they perceived that, yes, Jesus was who he says he was. They came to a belief, a faith in that God. He was indeed the Son of God. And then they needed to know, what do we do? And he said, you repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2.41 says, so then those, listen to him, so then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. And verse 46 says, Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all, all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Who were the, who were the ones being saved? The ones that were baptized? the ones that repented, that had come to an understanding of who Jesus was, developed a faith in that, a trust in that, and that trust, trusting faith led to them being obedient to the message that Peter gave them. Repent and be baptized. Having you know, Wash away your sins. What a beautiful thing. We're given another example of that in Acts 8, beginning in verse 35. The eunuch had... Philip had been called to the chariot by the, by the Spirit, and the eunuch was reading from Isaiah. And Philip asked him, do you understand what you read? How can I, unless someone explain it to me? In verse 35, the Bible says that Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was, found himself at Az Az Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. We can and should accept the gift of salvation. And once we've accepted that gift, it's our responsibility to go out and share it, to obey the message receive it when you're given a gift you have a choice of either accepting it or not accepting it opening it or not opening it God freely offers the gift of salvation but it's our choice we either do obey it or we do not obey it every single time it has been offered that choice has been made Today we've looked at John chapter 9 and the healing of the blind man, the do's and don'ts of that. I encourage you to remember, don't, do not conceive and embrace the teaching of man. There are many who will tell you that there is a different way in order to come to God. But God has given us a clear way in order to have our sins forgiven. 
Let's do perceive the authority of Christ. Let's do believe that He is the Son of God. And let's do receive the message and then obey it. If you are not a child of God, I pray that you have perceived and you're willing to believe and you're willing to receive and you want to do that this morning. And if you are a child of God, please continue in the things that you have learned. Do not conceive something new. Do not believe the teaching of man that would take you away. Deceive you against the things that God has given us, that Christ has taught us. If you're here this morning and we can help you in any way, please, please come now while we stand and sing.